everyone, welcome back to the Study Tube Project. Today you're back with me, Rosie, aka Just a Little Roo, and I'm going to be sharing my best revision method with you. <laughs> that rhymed! <laughs> Yes, this video is about revision and if you think that is going to stress you out in any way please just don't feel the need to watch it at all come back to it later if you're not in the right headspace for this i have a favorite revision method i think everyone will have a different favorite revision method but i have used this one for all of my essay subjects since GCSE. This will work for essay subjects and you might be able to adapt it for non-essay subjects but i didn't do any non-essay subjects at A-level so here we are. Again, this is just my favourite revision method. It might not fit with you, it might not sit right, it might work really well, I don't know. But, but what you need to do with revision is just keep working at different methods until one just clicks and works and you really like it. For me, that was this one, so I thought I'd share it with you. I did get all A's and A stars at GCSE and the same at A level, so I think it worked. This helps to keep things in your head and particularly for essays, building structure. It really helps with that. So let's get on with it. Chances are you are going to start off with booklets like these and like this one. These are all of my actual A level and AS level booklets. They have lots of notes in probably and looking at them isn't very exciting or helpful. Okay? So what do you do next? When you're coming to revise, the key first thing that you need to do is to make sure you actually understand what it is you've written. Chances are half of it, you don't. And that's talking from experience. And what you have to do in that case is just go back over the notes. However many times that takes you, just keep doing it. Start earlier rather than later because if you're like me, there'll be lots of things that you've written down at the time and now don't have a clue what it was meant to refer to. So here actually in my sociology notes um, we were learning about the myth of meritocracy and I had a revision guide that was literally just a photocopied revision guide. That was the resource that we'd been given and I hadn't done anything with it so the first thing I did before I could revise it is went through and actually highlighted which bits seemed important. Highlight things that you think are important and write them down on a separate piece of paper. So don't write everything because that defeats the whole point. Just write in bullet points those key facts that you find out of a text or out of an essay that you wrote or out of class notes. For GCSE, revision guides are gonna be very helpful for this because they do some things up very well, but there's a lot of websites that can help you too. There's a lot of like PowerPoint presentations online and YouTube videos that actually explain things in quite simple terms, which you just have to dig for, but they are there. I used a lot of them for sociology and for geography case studies when I was doing it. Like if you get to a point in revision where you're just a bit brain dead, then I go and watch videos because it goes in without you really realizing it too much. If you are at degree level, then you might want to use things like Google Scholar. If you're at A level but are reaching for the A's and A stars, then things like the directory of online academic journals, DOAJ, is a good one to use because they're all free access journals and you might be able to find something a little bit more complex than what's listed in your either revision guide or just like a booklet that you've been given. I wouldn't go too over the top with finding extra sources, especially if you're a bit too late in the year. I would focus on just understanding the things you've got, but it is always nice early on to find some extra resources that you can try and understand, even just basically, and then come back to later on. But make sure they're written in a different colour so that you know they're not like essential. So once you've got a piece of paper with your essential key thing, because your essential dates, your essential key words, summed up, once you've summed up your notes essentially on a separate piece of paper, make sure it is easy to understand, easy to read, make sure you do actually get it. If you don't even the third time round, go at it again because it is that understanding that will stay with you before you actually even get to the method that I'm actually going to tell you. All of this needs to be done first.
So now we get on to the main event and for me that is mind mapping. I just love it because I guess it probably mimics my brain a bit. It's just a bit of an explosion in different colours and for me that helps just to get all of your different ideas on the paper. It is also nice on a mind map because you can link things together and from that you can make a more complex essay answer. So this is a mind map I did in my AS level for sociology. I'm using sociology a lot in this because I have all of my stuff in front of me because I tutored it so I still have it or I've kept it. But this was my SCLY2 initial mind map. Now that probably looks a bit terrifying and I agree it does. I also made these for biology, I remember vividly, they were even worse, but this is just an initial kind of brain explosion, but not quite. Each little bubble is a different inner topic or a different point of view, so if I was doing, let's use sociology again, if I was doing a functionalism mind map I might have the family in schools or in crime in the different boxes or if I was going to go even further I might have functionalism 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 and the family then I might have Merton Parsons and Durkheim now the main thing I like about mind maps is that you can do basically as many little bubbles and links off as you want so you can see that here I've got a mini a, a mini a, a smaller bubble for theories and then I've got functionalism, Marxism, new right, all different ones that you can put off. So here is an example from my degree level, this is from first year, it is on the origins of like agriculture and animal management in the ancient Near East. So my mini bubbles are the ones that are in green, I haven't put a bubble around them but that's what they are, they're in green and each green for me meant a different key topic, key point of discussion, and pink is the name of a key thinker and the date that they said it, which is important, really important at degree level, also important at A level, I would say, if you want to go for the A's and A stars you need to know the names of people and preferably the dates, but more so the names. The dates are important when you're critiquing and talking about if evidence is like too old and outdated then dates are really important. I can show you what I mean again with that in my sociology. The pink in this case is my different topic headings and the yellow is the people who said it. So essentially what you're doing in your mind map is you're splitting it into different talking points within an essay. So say my topic was gender differences in education, that would be in the middle. I would then have things like GCSE results, subcultures, ethnicity to weave in, class to weave in, and I might also, within those topic titles, have smaller sections to argue the functionalist versus the Marxist approach. The key things that you need to do on your mind map is have who said what in one colour, the main topic heading or area of research in another colour, any key facts and figures that you want to remember in another colour, and just make sure you've linked things as well. One thing I really like about mind maps is how you can link different sections together. And you can see that on this one that I've done for my degree. So these are all separate bits, but I've linked things together at the bottom. And what that allows you to do is to create a more complex argument that isn't just an essay that goes this person's view, this person's view, this person's view. It allows you to link things to the previous paragraph and weave in opinions, critique, and that makes it so much more complex and flows so much better and allows you to then have a higher grade answer. And I find it is hard to get that complexity without sort of practicing that in your planning. Once you have a big mind map, when we get closer to an exam situation, closer to having to hand an essay in, I make my mind map smaller. So you can see that in these ones, 
this is from my A2 levels, so these could be essay topics again, but say we're doing the social construct of childhood, it's broken down even further, so it looks more simple, but essentially what this is, is the title and different paragraph headings, so this is more of a last minute revision thing. I'll look again at my degree level stuff, so this is my starting point, awful notes, didn't really make a lot of sense to me, they were all in one colour, messy, they needed switching up and improving. So I would make something more like this. So I'd start to add colour. That's what I mean about highlighting the key facts and writing it out a bit more in a way you can understand. After that we would go to the mind map. So we've got the essay title, the different sections. So what I've got here we said I've got green is straightforward and then these are critique after i've got that mind map because it's still a bit much i would then condense it into smaller mind maps like these ones they're a horrible color because they were on my wall but like these ones like these little ones that are a bit less complex but still highlight who said what and have different paragraph headings. And I would then also convert some of them into small essay cards. And these are my degree ones, but I also did this for my A-levels. The mind map is great for organising your thoughts and having just a bit of a mental splurge, linking things together, checking your understanding. What these cards are good for, if I can find any more of them, because they're all over my bed right now. What these cards are good for is putting it all into a very small place, like before an exam, and then you can revise from these really last minute because it's all there. Here, for example, we have gender differences in education. You, all we can see is I've got from my big my big mind map, we've got the internal factors and the, edu the external factors in gender differences in education. I've whittled it down to this card. So on one side we have the internal factors, one side we have the external factors. In green I've got the different subtopics, so like the paragraph titles. In orange I've got key things to remember, so key studies, key phrases, statistics, and then in yellow I've got who said what, key thinkers. And I've done that for a lot of different things. I did this for geography with case studies. So with geography I would have had probably A5, so that, that big. They were called case study cards in geography and I would split them into social, physical, political and economic factors. That would be my different sections. Now you can do another step after this, which I did for my finals, because I just wanted to make sure I knew everything. This is gonna look really chaotic in my book because it was written half an hour before my final exams. But after we've got, our cards, we come to just before the exam. Now these are the night before the exam, so I did go back to my mind maps actually, but these are all from memory, so there's a point where you have to stop, you know, making resources and start doing it from memory, and these are like speed mind maps. So I would put the essay topic in the middle and then speed mind map off with critique and main topic areas the night before an exam. I didn't do this for A-level because I hadn't learned to do that yet, which is why I'm telling it you this is what I've learned to do for my degree, so it's taken years and years of seeing what works for me to get to this point. So the morning of an exam, I do this. What I've done is I've written down my best topics and then simply written down the names of the people that I remember that I should be referencing in the essay, that is it. I haven't extended on what that means, I haven't said when they said it, I've simply written who said something, because when I'm in an exam, the first thing I do when you're making a plan in the exam is write down all of the people that I should have remembered, because then things start coming back to you once you remember trigger words. So you can use any trigger words for me, 
I liked using the author's name because then I definitely remembered what they are but the way you find your trigger words is to go through this process of whittling it down and simplifying it more and more and eventually you will remember certain things, certain facts, figures or people's names that lead you to being able to write the whole paragraph in it and for structure wise it is really useful to have done all of these processes so that you can learn things in an order as well if you learn the names in an order or learn which names go, which trigger words critique other ones, which order they should be in, it's easier to make an essay that flows. I was gonna like really simplify this whole video but it's not a simple process, like it takes a while so I did just want to explain everything exactly how I do it and then you can use it in any way that you wish to. If you want to follow one step, two steps. If you want to follow all of the steps, then great. I hope it works for you. And like I said, it might not work for you, you know? Not all revision works for everyone. I can't deal with cue cards. That's, I just can't do it. Whereas other people absolutely love cue cards. I hope it helps. And if it doesn't, then don't panic. There will be other YouTubers on here talking about their favorite revision methods in time. So someone else might be able to help you. Thank you for watching. If you did enjoy the video, if it did help you, then obviously give us a thumbs up, please, because then we know what sort of content you want. Subscribe to The Solitude Project and subscribe to me if you did enjoy. And I'll see you in my next video of The Solitude Project. Bye!